My name is Daniel Pfeiffer. I will talk about CMake. Um, my motivation for this talk here, why, why uh, talk to you about uh, CMake, is because here I have a large audience of library developers. And the important takeaway for you library developers is the way you use CMake, and that is including not using CMake at all, affects your users. Um, so very often, for example, I, w I want to um, include a library in my project and I see, um, okay, this library is even built with CMake, so it should be easy to include it into my project. And sadly, that's not the case. So I will give you some, some guidelines um, how, you can, how you can make that better so it's easier to use your code. Um, recently, uh, when you follow the, the status of build systems, we see there, from time to time, there's coming up a new, sys new build system, and we ask, why, um, why C++ at all? And very interestingly, um, there's some, some similarities with C++. Uh, so both CMake and C++, they have a large user base. Um, I would say they dominate the industry. Um, they also both have a very focus, very strong focus on backwards compatibility. So we, uh, we try not to, not to break anyone's code by adding or removing new features. Um, they have a, both are very complex and feature rich. Um, C++ is called a multi-paradigm language and I would also say that CMake is a multi-paradigm tool set. So it's not only um, CMake that you can use to configure a project, but it comes with a collection of other tools um, for different use cases. Both have somewhat bad reputation. I've heard, heard the terms bloated and horrible syntax um, referring to both uh, CMake and C++. And they have some not very well-known features. And I hope, hope to show you some today. Um, my take about um, when, when someone tries to introduce a new build system uh, to, makes it so much better. Um, this is what I think this will lead to. And even if C++, uh, if CMake is not perfect, it would be better if you improve CMake and follow um, the, 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 the pragmatic CMake way instead of um, trying to replace it. Uh, from time to time in my talk, I will have such slides with a dark background. This is always when I want to give you um, Guidelines. This is the stuff that will be uh, will be asked in the exam afterwards. Um, this one is quite generic, um, just to serve as, as an example. I want to say you CMake is code. Um, that means what what that means is everybody should um, have his own imp interpretation uh, for that. So whatever is in important to you in your C++ code base, like don't repeat yourself or, or whatever, you should apply the same principles also in the configuration of your project. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the ugly syntax of CMake. Uh, CMake is organized like this. Um, we have directories. Directories are the entry point for um, generating a build system. Um, those contain a file called cmakelist.txt. Um, and you can add subdirectories with the add subdirectory command, and those subdirectories then also need to have a CMake list file uh, inside. Then we have scripts. Um, scripts are executed with CMake minus P. It would even be possible to ha put a, a hash bang in a CMake script and, uh, and setting the executable flag so you can execute CMake scripts on the command line. Um, in CMake scripts, not all CMake commands are supported. Things like add project, um, things like add, add executable, are only allowed in um, in projects. And then we have modules. Modules are CMake files located in the CMake module path variable. So, when you use the include uh, commands to include a, a module, either in a CMake project or in a CMake script, this will then um, include the module. And um, of course, it's only possible if that module also just uses the commands that are allowed in, in a script, if you, if you include it from a script. Commands in CMake, 
look like as the CMake um, files look like this. You have commands, and then a space separated list of strings. So each variable, um, each identifier is a is a string in CMake. Scripting commands they change the state of the command process, uh, processor. For example, you can set variables, but there's also ways to affect the behavior of other commands. In project commands, you can create build targets and change build targets. And uh, important command invocations are not expressions in the CMake language. So you cannot um, put a command invocation directly as an argument of a, another, another command or inside an if condition. That's not possible. Um, in CMake, we have variables. Um, they are set using the set command and then expanded using the dollar uh, and curly brace. Um, as I said, all variables are strings. Even lists, they just have the convention that they are separated by semicolon. Um, CMake variables are not environment variables. That's a, that's a mistake some people say. They think, OK, why is it not defined? I've set it here. No, CMake variables are separate from the environment. And if a variable um, is expanded using the dollar curly brace and this was previously not set, it expands to an empty string. So that's a source of problems and therefore it's often um, advocated to avoid variables. Comments uh, in CMake, there are two forms. Um, the one is probably widely known, the single line comments. The multi line comments are not widely known. At least it's not known by the syntax highlighting engine of the slides here. Um, multi line comments, they start with a, with a hash and then brackets, then any number of, of equal signs, another bracket, and they're closed by closing brackets, the same number of equal signs and a closing bracket, and therefore they can be nested. And it's also very interesting, if we add an additional hash here in this line, then the line three will turn into a single line comment, or the thing becomes enabled, and this is also a single line comment. Okay. Um, then we have generator expressions in the CMake language. Um, this is introduced with a dollar angle bracket syntax. And those are evaluated during uh, project generation. So later in the project generation step, um, those variables are, are expanded. So in scripts, they're, they're just strings. And since they are evaluated during um, project gener generation, they are not supported in all places, only in places where you really um, modify the build target. So it's obvious that it's not supported inside an if, because the if is evaluated during um, during the processing run. Okay. It is possible in CMake to set custom commands. And there are two ways of commands. Um, the commands can either be added with a function or the macro command. Okay. And the difference between a function and a macro is like the difference in C++. And this one is probably something that uh, not many people of you knew. Um, when you create a command and a previous command with that name already exists, then the, the old command is accessible um, with an underscore prefix. Okay, and we will see how, how interesting, um, what interesting use cases that allows. So this is how we define a custom function in, in CMake. We use the function commands and the name and any other of input arguments. And um, it, because it introduces a scope, variables that you set inside that function are just valid inside that function unless you set it using this parent scope keyword. Then it's, uh, the variable is set in the, in the place where it is called. Um, and inside the function we have the variables, available variables that we, that we gave names in the argument list here, uh, but also the argument count. Um, that's the total number of arguments. The argv is the, um, is the uh, number of arguments, the, 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 the actual list of arguments. Then argn, those are, is the list of arguments that we haven't assigned names to. 
and then there's arc zero, arc one, arc two, up till uh, arc nine, um, and this allows us to support um, uh, optional arguments. For example, in this case here, dollar curly brace output, closing curly brace expands to bar. However, if we define a macro, um, this does not um, introduce an additional scope, and those um, those 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 things here are not treated as variables, but they are just uh, text replacements. Um, most of the time, this does not really make a big difference. Um, the only difference is when you check whether the um, a variable with the name input exists, then in this case here, it doesn't, because it's not a variable. Can you imagine from what you, what you heard now, when to add a macro and when to use a function? then you should use what? Function. A function, yeah, but with a macro, I mean, since it doesn't introduce a new scope, when you, when you define a variable here, it's also available in the parent scope. So therefore, the guideline that I will give you is create macros if you want to wrap a command that has output parameters, because you don't know what this command will set in its parent scope, and you don't know what to forward, so you can wrap it as a macro, and then it will have the same side effects as the wrapped commands, but um, otherwise, you should create a function and avoid side effects. Okay. So now you learn, you know how to add ma custom functions and uh, custom commands in CMake. But at some point in time, you may realize it actually was a bad idea to add it. So how do we evolve CMake code? Um, you know, um, you want to. Reduce, uh, we, you want to remove the custom command, but it's probably used all over the code ba uh, base already. So how do you remove it without breaking the code? Uh, you want to add some form of deprecation mechanism. So this is what I would do. Create a macro in this case, because we want to have the same side effects as the wrapped function. Inside that macro, we call a deprecation message, and then uh, run the original command and which simply forward all the arguments. Similarly for variables, it's a little bit more complicated. We want to make sure that the hello variable is no longer used. Um, so, so we want to warn when someone accesses that variable. There's this interesting um, built-in command in CMake called variable watch. You can register a function that will be executed um, whenever the variable is accessed. So in this case here, we, we define a function called deprecated var. We give it uh, which variable and which um, access, whether it was read or write. And then we check whether it was read access. And in this case, um, we simply print out the deprecation message that the variable is deprecated. And deprecating custom commands and variables is probably what you should do, because variables are so CMake 2.8.12, and modern CMake is all about targets and properties. So we, call, so we talk about targets and properties next. Okay. You see here in this code, there are no variables at all. Right? Um, what you probably see in, um, in CMake code that you find is you, you define a list called source and it has all those source files and then depending on the platform you add some variables values to that list and also you have a list of link libraries and then in the end you call add library and target link libraries uh, with all those, all those um, variables. But you see here it's absolutely not necessary. We can add the library and then um, we add link libraries, and then later, depending on the platform, we can simply add additional sources or, or add additional li link libraries. So this is much more robust than using variables, because if you make a typo in a variable, it just will give you an empty string, and, have you, no, and you have no way to, to debug that. So therefore, avoid custom variables in the arguments of project commands. And this also has an implication. If you're not allowed to use variables, this of course also means you, means you don't use file glob in, in projects. How many use, 
Ha has someone used file glob in CMake? Yeah. Do you think it's a good idea? Is it useful? Yes, no. What is the problem? Well, it depends on which IDE because a lot of IDEs work around it, but it allows you to add files to the directory without modifying the CMake lists. And if you're not using Christmas Cube Creator, which will always invoke CMake, then your project is just updated accordingly. Right. So the um, the 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 answer was so the answer uh, that was a comment of why it is useful because um, you can simply add a file. And um, so, for example, you create the file from your IDE, and then depending on which IDE you use, for example, Qt Creator will simply run CMake always, but not all IDEs do that, and therefore um, you, will, uh, you, you will not get the effect of adding that file. Um, the fundamental problem of that is that CMake is not a build system. CMake is a build system generator. Now, I would say, File globbing in a build system is nice because when you trigger the build system, you will evaluate the globbing expression and you will get that list of files. But with CMake, it's different. CMake, you, you, when you generate the build system using CMake, it evaluates that globbing expression, gives you a list of files, but then in the actual build system, you will have that list of files. So when you trigger the build system, it will have no idea that something actually changed. Well, you may think it might be nice if, if CMake, instead of evaluating that globbing expression, would simply forward that globbing expression to the build system. So when you trigger the build system, that globbing expression is evaluated. But that's not supported by all build systems, right? It would be possible in Make, but it would not be possible in Visual Studio, for example. And since C CMake wants to have, um, wants to be that common denominator, it, it's, it's, not, it's just not possible. Therefore, File globbing is nice in CMake scripting mode because when you, when you execute a script, this is actually what you trigger. There, using that globbing expression will always evaluate it, but you should just not use it in CMake projects. Okay, so um, CMake has that concept of targets and it inherits that terminology for make files. Um, but you should, you may imagine this as an object-oriented concept. So you have a constructor like add executable or add library that creates uh, an object, basically. And um, those um, targets, they have properties. There are too many to list here, but just imagine those are member variables. And then you have member functions like those four generic ones here to, to set properties by name, but also um, those uh, commands here like target compile definitions, target compile features, target compile options, target include directories, target link libraries, and target sources. So calling such a function will modify the member variables of that object. Imagine like this. By the way, forget those commands. If you, if you ever uh, ever use them, refactor your code so you no longer use them. If you've never heard about them or used them, good. Okay, because those commands here operate on the, on the directory level. Okay, um, include directories, for example, sets a directory property um, on the current directory and all the targets that are like, like libraries that are created inside that directory will inherit um, those, um, those properties, but it just makes, makes it complicated to understand. Therefore, it's much, much better to just operate on the targets directly. So here is an example of um, one of those uh, member functions, target compile features. Um, all those commands use those keywords, public and private, and also interface. Um, you know, CMake commands, they just take a list of strings. So when you use your, um, your editor to indent it, uh, it would probably all on a single line. Okay? I usually use the indentation like this, that I put the keywords indented one level and all below uh, indented another level. So what we actually do here is we set the compile features and the interface compile features property. So everything um, that we, it is below public will be added both to compile features and interface compile features and everything that is private will just be added to compile features. What, what this actually does, adding the compile features, you're telling CMake, yeah? 
Okay, what this actually does, it, it tells CMake about the um, language features that you need inside that uh, library, for example. Okay, so that means in my public uh, header files, let's say I use some strongly typed enums, and inside my implementation I use lambdas and range-based for loops. Um, do you have a, yeah. Um, what I've seen previously, many people think, okay, my code requires C++ 11, so I set the appropriate um, compiler, um, compiler option to the, to the, command, the compiler command line that um, this passes minus std equals C++ 11. But this will break in the future, that's for guaranteed, because there's those requirements, they're also fulfilled in C++ 14 and 17. Right? And also, the compile flag is not the same on all compilers, so it's much better to tell CMake, those are requi my requirements, you figure out what compile flag sh should I use. Okay, so a comment on that though, I don't think, like, you can't get 17 out of 20, can you? Yeah, 3.8. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you go back two slides? No. This one? Two, what? Okay, um, I can come to that back later. So, um, because basically the replacement for at compile options. I'm more interested in the include part, for example. The include part. Okay, we, we talk about that later. A little later? Okay, okay. Okay. Um, because CMake has um, build specification and user requirements. This is something that it actually, um, that was actually inspired from boost build usage requirements, okay? Because you've seen previously we have this interface and non-interface target properties. So the non-interface properties define the build specification of that target and the interface properties define the usage requirements of that target, okay? So when we call a command like target include directories, and we use the private and interface and public keywords. So the private keyword will populate the non-interface property because it's for just for that target. The interface keyword populates the interface property. So that means the, builds, uh, the, the, the usage requirements and the public keyword populates both. So it means it's both valid for the target itself plus all the targets that link against it. <coughs> So when you use the um, commands target link libraries, you express the direct dependencies. And this command also then resolves all the transitive dependencies. So to answer your question in boost, you would add a, let's say, um, a library called boost file system. And you set the public include directories for boost file system. So anyone who links against boost file system will get the correct include directory. Right? That's, that's why I said it's all about targets and properties. Yeah? So one more on boost, right? I mean, there's a, and maybe you're going to get to this, right? There's a find package boost. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that will be very difficult to use. Yeah. Yeah. I will, I will get to this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the question was um, about Boost. There, there is a find package for Boost and it's very difficult to use and I will come to that later. Okay. So an example of target link libraries. Um, I use target link libraries, public, foo, uh, public bar and private cow. Um, so that means that uh, the target bar um, is added to the link libraries and to the interface link libraries because it's public. Um, the target cow is added to the link libraries. It's just the build specification of that target. But that's not all, because it effectively also adds all the interface property of bar to the, their corresponding properties and interface properties, and it also e effectively adds all the interface properties of cow to property. Not to, in this case, not to the interface property because it's private. 
I say effectively because it's not really what this command does, it's really what is done later when the dependencies are resolved transitively. Because um, those targets may not be defined yet, right? So the, those are um, transitively evolved after all targets are defined. And very important, it also adds the, this generator expression here to the interface link libraries. Because imagine um, if a library is a static library and it depends on another library and you want to link that static library, then on the command line you, uh, you will see that both the library that you directly depend on plus the dependency of that library appear in the command line. But in CMake you just express the, the abstract interfaces uh, and therefore CMake needs to know um, I mean, you, you need to know that this target is linked only, but the um, include directories, uh, for example, are not uh, transitively added to this uh, target foo here. Yeah? Where does the bar colon colon bar come from? What, what is that syntax? Okay, this is a target that is defined in some other place. And um, the syntax, why we have this colon colon here, is that for legacy reason, when you use target link libraries and the name, and that name is the name of a target, then, um, then CMake just assumes, uh, if, if that is a target, it will CMake will be able to resolve the dependency. If it is not a target, it will assume it's probably a library and will add minus L name, of the, name what you provided to the linker command line, okay? So when you made a typo there, um, it, the linker will fail, right? And this colon colon syntax here cannot be a valid file name, which means it has to be a target, which means when you make a typo here and that target does not exist, you will get an error during CMake generation and not after compilation during linking. No, no, that, that does not have, this, have to be the same name. It would be nice to have boost colon colon file system, for example. Shall we co continue? More Sorry. questions? Yeah. When the columns, you have to put them on the target name. Yes. So I, will, I could define a target link library foo colon colon foo. Yeah. The important part is it's a namespace. It's an, you can imagine it as a namespace, yes. I will come to that later. Okay. Yeah. So the, the question was, what I come to later, um, where do we define the namespace? Yeah. Um, it's also possible to have libraries that are pure usage requirements, right? When, we, when you create um, a library of the interface type, this is actually not a library. So you, it's impossible to set, um, to set a build specification, like um, public or private, um, uh, include directories, for example, for that. This is just a pure um, requirement, okay? In this, for example, we create a library and we define target compile definition uh, bar equal one. So every, um, every executable or library that links against bar will have that variable defined. Um, this is very useful for header-only libraries. You create a header-only library as, a, as just a pure interface you add the target include directories for that library so that everybody who will link, uh, it's not really linking, but it's expressing a dependency on that library will get the right include directory. Okay. However, please don't abuse requirements. For example, um, adding w all to the, uh, to the compile flags is not a requirement to build that project. So now we talk about project boundaries. Um, how you should um, link against external libraries? I would say always like this. You, you call find package with the name you, that you want to find. You may require a particular version number and you can say whether this is optional or whether you, whether you actually require it. Here in this case we say foo is required. And then 
this find package here will import a target in the foo name space uh, of the name foo. And then we use that always like this. Now, the question is, um, if foo is a static library and it depends on other libraries, how should it look like this? How should it look like in, the, in this case? Sorry? It should look like exactly the same way, right? If foo is a header-only library, how should it look like in this case? The same way, right? You, you begin to understand what I mean when I say always. Okay, but, the, but now the question is, how does, how does, where does this foo actually come from? When you call find package, you may know that this will then search for a find module. Uh, this is, for example, a find module for, for foo. It looks like this. It, it searches for the include directory. Uh, it searches for the library, marks those variables as advanced so they do not appear in the cache editor. Then this is some, some standard handling. Uh, this, um, this code here handles the required keyword and the version number. Um, and then you have this here. If foo is found, which is, which is set by, uh, for pine, by find package handle standard arcs, and the target foo, colon, colon, foo is not defined, then we create an imported library here with that name, and we set the necessary target properties, and we're done. Okay, so this is a very, very basic example. Question? I mean, if I, if I add the version, um, it would not fit readable, uh, reason, readable on the slide here. I will show uh, another example in a minute. What's the unknown? Um, unknown here means we do not know whether it's a, the question was what does unknown mean? In this case, it means we do not know whether this is a static or uh, a shared library. Okay. So this is a very basic example. It does not uh, handle the version number. It does not handle um, different configurations. You can imagine there may be a debug and release config. Uh, excuse me. Use a library no, no, <laughs> don't, no. <laughs> That's not what I provide. No, sorry, I will come to that. This, this is, this is what many people, um, this is what many people do. They think they are, there are library authors. They need to provide something like this. No, this is just the basic example of of how find modules uh, look like. Okay. So, like I said, this does not handle many cases. It does not ver handle the version number. It does not handle different configurations. For example, we want to make sure that in the debug build, we link against the debug library. In the le release build, we want to re uh, link against the release library. This is not done here. And also, we just have some properties that we set here. This may not really be the actual usage requirement that was defined by the library author. Right? In reality, those find modules look much more like this. Um, so um, I'm not sure about the resolution. Can you read this in the back? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. So um, this, is, this is much, much more. And this is the example for find PNG. Um, and the find module for PNG is served as a good example, right? But you get the point here that it's way too complicated. And the, the most important part is that it's a lot of guessing. So because the, the library author knows what the dependencies are, and then when he creates a package, that information is completely thrown away. And then we have this lots of guessing what the actual interface uh, requirement was. So now I come to the point what you should do as library authors because find package does not look for find modules. Before it does, it looks for, find, for CMake packages. And you can use CMake to generate those packages. So the question is, um, so the, the, the guideline is use a find module for third party libraries that are not built with CMake. Okay, for example, PNG is not built with CMake, and therefore CMake provides a find module for PNG. Okay, and, and this is exactly the point. Many authors ask, um, where should I, when I write a, C, uh, a find module for my library, where should I put it? 
Yes. Uh, again, what do you do if you have a, um, a library that's header only, so you don't provide build anything because you don't have dependencies? Uh, do you mean as a client of that library? So, so as the question. A provider of such a library. As a provider of such, as a provider of a header-only library, you should still use a build system, because you ha don't have just that library. You also have tests and documentation and, and all that stuff. <coughs> so that I don't deliver. You don't deliver it, but you should still. I mean, you should. In any case, you, you should use a build system even for header-only libraries, because because you want to run the tests, basically. You don't deliver that, but you still use a build system. And you still use um, a target in your build system for that header-only library, because those will be consumed by the tests. And since you already have this, this interface target, you can export it to the clients using CMake. You see here, um, this uh, text here is rather at the top. You, you can imagine there will be something else coming. Um, this is not ac accurate. It's not about whether you use CMake or not. It's whether you want to use, you want to support clients to use CMake. Okay? Uh, for example, Boost does not support clients to use CMake. Um, C there, there is a find module for Boost that comes with CMake, so CMake uh, supports clients to use Boost in CMake, but that the support really comes from CMake. It does not come from Boost. Uh, Qt, on the other hand, is not using CMake at all. It uses their own build system, but they support clients to use CMake. So they, ex they provide uh, CMake packages that can be included using find package. So you can write in your project find package Qt5, but there's no find module for Qt5. This is a, it's a CMake package that is shipped with Qt. Therefore, if you need to write a find module for a third-party library, report this as a bug to the authors. Uh, because CMake, is, um, CMake dominates the industry, most people use it, and if a library author does not support it, it's a problem. Okay. <coughs> So I will show how to export the library interface using CMake. And then you can, when you want to support another build system, uh, you can look what CMake generates and generate the same thing. For example, add support for that in, in Boost Build. So we have this library foo. It may be a header-only library, right? So it may be a static library or it may be a shared library, whatever. We have some usage requirements. In this example here, we say we link against bar. Bar may also be a header-only library. We don't care. We just say this is, a this is a requirement of that. So we have that defined, OK? Now we install the library. Um, and we define the location where the, the library <coughs> destination, which means the, the archives and uh, shared uh, and SO files should, uh, should appear. So the, um, the archives appear in, in lib, and the libraries appear in lib. The runtime component will end up in bin. So uh, imagine on Windows, this will be the DLL. And we say the include destination is include. And this is, exp this is the uh, interesting part here. We store all that in an export set called foo targets. And we do not install the li only install the library, we also install the export set. Okay, we say we install the export set called foo targets in this file here. So this file will be generated by CMake. We say then the library foo should appear in the namespace colon, foo colon colon. And we say where this destination for the file is. So it's a, it's a, a common pattern to use uh, lib slash CMake dot uh, slash and then the name of the of the component. This is one thing. The other thing is the for the version. Uh, there, CMake provides this um, this this helper uh, helper module here, where you can generate um, a file that that checks the version number. And we also write a, another file by hand because uh, we said before we we saw before here. The, the, the library foo depends on bar, okay? So CMake 
when we, when we create this export set, then CMake knows that it depends on a target called bar, but it doesn't know where the target comes from. So we have to give um, the client this information as well. So this is a file that we write by hand. Um, we include this module here and we call the function find dependency with a bar, uh, the correct version number, and then we include the file that was generated by CMake. And both the version file plus the file that we wrote by hand, we install also to the same location. This is some boilerplate. Um, and I would like, uh, so I would wish this was be, would be more easier, but at least this is straightforward, whereas the find uh, module was just guessing where is, what is located. This is basically what all libraries need, right? Always the same thing. No matter how many dependencies I have, or no matter whether they set um, include directories or compile flags or compile definitions or whatever, basically this is what you need in every case. I have a question because of my ignorance. Uh, that destination, is that a relative to the build? It's re relative to the installation directory. So on Linux, that would mean. So it's not, not related to the build directory where you actually generate the make files and no, make everything. No. Related. It's related to, to the installation route. So the CMake install prefix. <laughs> it's not the CMake install prefix. Uh, when, when you simply run uh, make install, then the installation route will be the CMake install prefix. But when you use CPack to create a package, then it will install to a temporary directory and then take the content from that directory and put it into an archive. So it's really a relative path. Yeah. So and these you would all put in your main CMake lists.txt file? This would appear in your main CMake list file, yes. Okay. I mean, it does not have to be the main one. It can be in a subdirectory. Yeah. You can put everything in one file, that's correct. And then I don't really get the, the last line on the bottom, why you would include the two targets that CMake has. Right. The question is why to include the, the foo targets that CMake. Okay, let's say this file here is called foo config. It's a, and it contains just this, these three lines. But I, I thought, and, I mean, my previous question was, is this all within the same file? In the same CMake? Ah, so, sorry, sorry. Um, Sir, this is in your CMake. Okay, this is the place where you create the um, um, the, the executable, uh, the, the library. This is directly following. Okay. This here is still the same file, and this is a separate file. Okay, because this is a file that you install. So you basically install several files. This one. The one that is generated here, which is called foo config version, and the foo targets, and this one depends on a, not, on, on, on a set of files. Right? This, this foo targets is then a file that includes all the, uh, the, the target definitions per configuration. So one for debug, one for release, um, even more if you have more configurations. Um, very important, Import, export the right definition. For example, your target include directory, maybe when you build, it may be different than when you install. When you install, it's probably just includes. So we use this generator expression that in the install interface, we use include, and in the build interface, we use uh, directory in the current build directory and also in the binary directory because imagine you have generated files, right? When you, in your, in your build tree, you have a directory where you put all your include files. You will have a di include directory also in the, in the build directory because you want to generate, a, I don't know, config.h or your, your version information or whatever. But when you install, you install everything to the same location. So in your, in your builds, in your, Using the build interface, you will have two directories, and in the install interface, you just have one. Okay. So, now we know how to, how to tell CMake all the information that should appear in a package. Now let's actually create packages. Um, 
Training packages is done with CPAC. CPAC is a tool that comes together with CMake and using it is really straightforward. Um, there's a CPAC config.cmake that basically has all just the list of set commands where you set some variables. Um, so I will not go into much uh, detail of that. I just want to give you um, a hint how I usually do uh, use it. Because you, you can also set, use the set command and set the, uh, the CPAC variables in your cmake.list.txt file and then include the CPAC module. And this module will then take all those variables and create a CPAC config for you. And the way I usually do it, I wrote my own CPAC config and in that file I include the one that is generated from CMake. And this allows me to set additional variables in the CPAC configuration that I do not want to appear in my project. For example, I can't set the, um, the license file, uh, not the license file, but for example, the, the email address that customers should use to, to contact the authors or so. It doesn't, doesn't have to appear in the project definition. I put that in a separate file. Okay. And another interesting use case is this. In CPAC, there is this variable called CPAC install CMake projects. Now the documentation of that command says it's a list of four values, but it's not a list of four values. It's a list of quadruples, okay? Because you can install several CMake projects. And the first value is always the build directory, then the project name. I don't know why this is required. I think it's redundant. Then the project component and the location where it should appear in the package. And a way of using this, first we need to make some changes in the CMake lists file. We set a CMake debug postfix, okay? So, and we set it to minus D. So imagine we have a, a library called foo. Uh, the actual file name will be libfoo.a, for example, in release build. But in debug build, it will be called libfoo-d.a. So they don't, do not overlap. I can install both to the same directory and they will have, have different file names. And that, then I use the following CPAC config. I include, um, so second step is I create separate build trees for debug and release. And the third step is I create the CPAC config here. I just include one of the two, either debug or release, just to get all the information that CMake by default sets. And then I overwrite this variable here. So I say it should install the, the foo project from the debug uh, directory, take all the components and put it in the root of the package. And also from the release directory, take this, the foo project, all components of that, and put it also in the root of the same package. So, question. The, build tree, the question was whether the build tree is now hard-coded. No, it's not. This is, this is just a file that I generate using, um, so this is a CPAC config file. I generate this when I make a, want to make a package. Right? I usually have a script where I can tell it, okay, here's the source directory. So then the script will create two build trees, configure both, compile both, and then one level above create this file run CPAC on that, and it will take the debug and the release build, put it in the same package. So it's not committed to the sheet. This file is not committed, no. Okay, so since we now can import packages and also export packages, we basically have all the building blocks to create a package management system. Um, I will not present one, but I will show my requirements for a package manager. Because there are several approaches of making a package management system in CMake. And I think I haven't found one that really fulfills all my requirements. My requirements is I want to support system packages. So when, I, when libz is installed on a system in a version that I can use, I see no reason why the package manager should download an additional one. Then it should be support both pre-built libraries and also building dependencies as sub-projects. So I, can, I want to mix and match, take this dependency pre-built, this other dependency as source. And the 
Another important uh, requirement, it should not require any changes to my projects. So what I've shown previously, things like using add library, find package, etc., that is the way CMake should be used. So when you have a package manager that requires you to use, uh, I don't know, PM at targets or PM at library instead of add library or, or uh, download dependency instead of find package, no, I'm, ag I'm against that. Uh, really, it should be just the way I just presented and I can guarantee it is possible. As said before, external libraries should always be used like this. And now we go through all the three steps. It should support system packages, subprojects, and um, downloading as pre-built libraries. So let's have a look. If you just write this, then system packages will work out of the box. Okay, because, because CMake will just be able to find it. Pre-built libraries will not work out of the box because CMake doesn't know where the pre-built one is put. Okay, so let's imagine you have a package manager that puts all the dependencies that it downloads to a known directory. Just tell this directory to CMake. So you put it into, you set the variable CMake prefix path and this is where CMake will then look for the dependencies in addition to the system. With subprojects, we have two problems. Um, because imagine this, you have this master build and it has two directories here. This is directory foo and this is your actual application and the actual application will call find package foo. But we need to, some way to prohibit that because, um, because foo is, is part of the same Pro, sub, uh, super project basically. So um, therefore we need to turn find package into a no-op and we also need to make sure that we have this, this uh, naming convention here with a colon colon. So let's talk about the second step first. Imagine simply as an additional guideline to your, your, to your CMake projects, whenever you, uh, whenever you export a library in a namespace, foo for example, your, your export the library foo in a namespace foo, at the same time also create an alias foo colon colon foo. That means that um, using foo inside the same build tree will look the same as using it as an external library. I put this also here as a guideline. And then for the other part, uh, I'll show you this trick here. So this is the top level CMake project. We set the prefix path and we set a list of subprojects that we know uh, are built as subprojects. And then we override the find package command where we simply check whether the, argu the first argument appears in this list and only if it doesn't, we call the actual find package. Okay, simple as that. And then, and then we add all the subdirectories. Is that clear? Why Question? It's not in, why do I want to add a subdirectory when it's in the system? No, it's not in the system. It is as a subproject. You see here, foo is in the list and subproject. Question? Again? This will support a super project directory structure 1D. What right, right. Have super projects and super projects? The question is, this allows a directory structure, a, a directory hierarchy that is one level deep. What, what to do when I have, want to have super project of super projects? I imagine, imagine a package manager, right? So you basically give the package manager a list of dependencies that you have. So, um, and, this, and then the package manager goes to a web service, downloads a JSON file, calculates a transitive list of dependencies, and in the end, it will have the information, three lists. It will know which libraries are, av are available in the system. It will know which libraries are pre-built and can be installed as binary packages, uh, can be downloaded as binary packages, and it will know which libraries need to be built as a sub-project. And then for the system libraries, it doesn't do anything because they work out of the box. For the libraries that need to, can be downloaded as pre-built ones, it will download them, put them all in the same directory, uh, in, in the prefix, for example, 
and for the list of uh, yeah basically in the end it will it will then i mean for the, for the others that are that are need to be built as subprojects it will download them or it will clone them to a known directory and then it will generate this file right it will set the cmake prefix path it will set the as subprojects list to all the things that are built as a subproject it will add this magic command and then and then it will call a subdirectory for all the things that are built as subprojects so we we will never have a deep hierarchy we always have this flat tree which is one level deep does it answer okay so i explained this how this works right um, and it does not matter whether whether foo actually provides uh, a package config or provides uh, or or if cmake or our own project uh, provides a um, a find module it will work in either case right so it will uh, if it's a system package then find package will either use the package uh, the, the foo config or the the find foo same in the build directory, and we, when we build it as a subproject, then find package simply does nothing, and the target foo colon colon foo is part of the project anyway, so it works in all three cases. Questions? So, uh, find foo where, where does this come from? Which one? Which, which? Find foo. Find foo .cmake. I mean, if foo does not distribute the um, uh, a foo config.cmake, then the, the project that depends on foo will need to have the find foo.cmake. Or it can comes from uh, or it can come from, from CMake itself. For example, for PNG, uh, it's available in CMake. So it, it, there are multiple multiple ways where it is. I'm just saying that when the library can be built standalone, it is also possible to use it using this concept of a package manager. And it does not require any changes. It's a single. So the prefix path is a single, um, is a single variable that contains a list of strings. So it can be a list of directories. Okay. Yeah. So what do you do with uh, libraries or or find uh, .cmake files that don't use the new target based approach, but return like the old style directories? The, the, or the question is, what do I do with targets that? Um, that do not follow this new approach of um, uh, of uh, target dependencies, etc. Okay, the first step is to give this presentation, and the next <laughs> the next step is you all fix your targets, and then the third step is we build this package manager. In the worst case, you can also uh, wrap the module and add the targets yourself. Right. In the in the worst case, you can we can wrap the module and as it add the target itself. Okay, C test. C test is also quite straightforward. Um, so C test um, allows C test scripting. So we have, for example, a CMake file called build.cmake, and we can run this with C test minus s build.cmake. And here uh, we have those commands: C test start, C test configure, C test build, test, coverage, mem check, and submit. The important takeaway here is that this is the place where you should configure your CI builds. So if you if you require special uh, special um, compile flags, uh, for example, here we want to we want to build with coverage information so that we can later run GCOF or uh, let's say you want to uh, run Valgrind that that also requires um, other compile flags, or we want to use the thread sanitizer or undefined behavior sanitizer, whatever. Um, this, all this information, how it's built on the CI machine, should be outside of your project, right? I have seen previously um, projects that run that uh, that, for example, find Valgrind and then re uh, re register additional tests in addition to the usual tests that run the same test with Valgrind, uh, it's absolutely not necessary. This information should be kept outside of the project, put into the, uh, the C-test build, because C-test knows how to run coverage, how to run memcheck, even how to parse the output of those tools so it then can um, send this information to C-dash. Question? Uh, 
the, 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 the question was, this file on the slide, whether that's a build .cmake or another file, I mean, don't confuse the, 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 the entry point for a project is called ctest, uh, cmake list txt. This is just some file that I usually put directly on the CI machine. So it's not committed into the, into the project because it will be completely project agnostic. I use the same build definition for wide range of projects. So, like I said, ctest scripts are the right place for CI-specific settings. Keep that information out of the project. It just makes it simpler. Um, a discussion that we have that uh, during the week is if I build targets, if I build project as a sub-project, and how do I make sure that when I run the tests, I just run my tests and not everything? We can do this by following a naming convention. Okay, whenever you add a test in CMake, do follow such a naming convention here. You prefix it with a project name, for example. And then when you run to, want to run all the tests, we can simply say ctests minus r, which means regular expression match. Um, all the tests that match, uh, four processes in parallel, and give us verbose output in the case the test failed. Right? And the same, config, same settings can also be passed directly in the ctest script. So this is a guideline, follow a naming convention for tests. Sometimes you want to have a test that fails to compile something, right? So, um, and we can do it like this. We add a library um, that just uh, consists of a single source file. We register a test, and the test command will be to run cmake minus minus build in the current build directory, which means build this project, but from our project, just that target. So it will try to build this target, which is normally excluded uh, from, from all, right? So when you run make, it will not build it. Only if you run this test, CMake will actually try to test, uh, to, to, to build this one. And then we can set a target, pr uh, we can set a test property that this command should fail. But that may be problematic because it may fail for the wrong reason. Maybe, um, maybe it fails to compile because it doesn't find the, um, the correct header file. But you what you actually want to, use, want to have is that it fails to compile because of some static assertion fires. Therefore, it's better to set the property that this, only, um, this test here only passes if this regular expression matches. And here we directly set the output of the, of the static assertion. Then there is this um, interesting thing. When you, um, when you cross compile, um, you can, there's this, uh, this variable here called CMA cross compiling emulator. Uh, you can set this to an emulator and this will be prefixed to the command line if the first command in the com uh, first um, identifier in a command line of the test is a known target to CMake. So it knows this is something that I currently built, so it prefixes it with a cross-compiling emulator, and this allows to run unit tests in Wine when you cross-compile for Windows, for example, or in, in QEMU uh, if you cross-compile for ARM. Um, something that I did previously, I simply set it to a script. Um, so the cross-compiling emulator is the shell script that takes the binary, as it copies it to uh, to an embedded platform, executes it there, and then reports the results. Okay. So, enter more cross-compiling. Cross-compiling is done in CMake using toolchain files. Uh, and it, this is about the extent that you should have in a, uh, a toolchain file in CMake. Um, everything above that is too complicated, right? So we, we set the target system, we set the compilers, we set where to find the dependencies, and maybe you also set a cross-compiling emulator. Uh, try to Google for the cross-compiling script for Android. It's a cup, it's thousands of lines or so. But this is uh, what I think should be the extent of a toolchain file. Uh, guideline, don't put logic in toolchain files. Write really a single toolchain file per build tar uh, per target platform that you want to support. Yeah. 
So this is my favorite thing, um, static analysis. This is something I recently uh, contributed to CMake. Um, but, but it starts uh, a little bit more generic. Question, what, what is your opinion about treating warnings as errors? It's a good thing? It's a good thing? Everybody agrees? But question, how do you do it? How do you treat warnings as errors? Sir? I control build system. So I no, no. I mean, uh, what, what mechanism do you use to oh, treat warnings as errors? You use a compile flag w error, for example. Okay, but does that really? S I mean, if you if you do that, do you really treat warnings as errors? I mean, okay. Let's answer this. Uh, let's ask a different question first. How do you treat errors? Sorry. No, how do you fix them? How do you, f how do you, fi or, uh, how do you treat errors? If if the error, I mean, if the build breaks, what do you do? Right. I mean, <laughs> you basically, you basically do this, right? Uh, when you have, yeah, when you have errors, you fix them or you reject pull requests or you hold off releases if the current uh, branch doesn't build. This is how you treat errors. So, what is the correct warnings? To treat, uh, what is the correct answer how to treat warnings as errors? I would say it's this. Okay? And I would also say I would never pass W error to the compiler because if you do, the compiler treats warnings as errors. So you can no longer treat them warnings as errors because you will no longer get any warnings. All you get is errors. And, and adding W error also causes some, all kinds of pain. You cannot enable it unless you already reached zero warnings. You cannot increase the warning level unless you already fixed all warnings introduced by that level. You cannot upgrade your compiler unless you already fixed all new warnings that the compiler reports at the warning level. You cannot update dependencies on, unless you already ported your code away from that, that are, from the symbols that are now marked as deprecated. And you cannot even mark your own internal code as deprecated uh, if it's still used. Right? So, and if it's no longer used, why mark it as deprecated? You could just remove it. So I would not use W error. Instead, I think this is a much better approach. Treat new warnings as errors. So follow this process here. At the beginning of a development cycle, for, for example, a sprint, allow new warnings to be introduced. Let's say you can increase the warning level. You can explicitly enable new warnings. You can update the compiler, you can update dependency, and mark your own symbols as deprecated. So w once you did this, you say, OK, n now we introduce new warnings. Now we enter a stage where we, uh, we just analyze the delta. When someone removes a warning, great. When the warning level stays the same, OK. If it increases, forbidden. Right? So we burn down the number of warnings until we reach 0, and then we can repeat the whole process. Yeah. The question is whether I have a good CI tool for tracking that. Um, I think it can be done with C test, but I'm not sure. So it, it's it's not solved completely yet. But I think this is the process that we that we should use to to allow or to to fix the warnings and introduce warnings and and so on. And if we have that, then we can think about new ways of introducing warnings. I mean, because the compiler is not the only tool. Okay, for example, Clang Tidy. Anybody heard about it? Yeah, hopefully. CPP Lint is, a, uh, is also a code checker from Google. Uh, include what you use um, is a tool that analyzes the includes and, and can report um, which includes are necessary and unnecessary. Clazy, uh, this is something that comes out of the KDE community. It's, um, it's a compiler wrapper that, that finds uh, C++ anti-pattern and anti-patterns. So now we go back to CMake uh, because we have target properties for static analysis. Okay, there's, there is uh, the target property, uh, for example, CXX Clang Tidy, uh, CXX CPP Lint, uh, CXX Include What You Use, and there's also Link What You Use. And what those three properties here at the, at the top do, um, they run the static analysis tool right before the compiler. Um, so 
the interesting thing here is that the, all the, the, the warnings from those tools will appear directly in your compiler output. So and therefore, you, you, you will get IDE support out of the box. Right? And also, the diagnostics are visible in, in C dash when you use CTest to submit the test results uh, to C dash. Um, OK, Lang here is a placeholder. It can be either be C or C. And all those properties are initialized with a variable uh, prefixed with CMake. Okay. But um, there's a limitation. Most of those tools report the diagnostic for a current source file plus the associated header file. So uh, when you have header files that are not, do not have any um, associated source file, you will not see the warnings, right? Um, many of those tool al tools allow you to set a custom header filter, uh, which just defaults to the current um, to the associated source file name. But you can relax that. The problem is now when you when you do, then you get the warnings for the same headers multiple times. It, it's much better. I think I think I've seen this in a in a talk from John Lakers. Um, this guideline here. For each header file, there's an associated source file that includes this header file at the top, even if that source file would otherwise be empty. Right? Uh, the, the comment from the audience is that my, this may be a compiler warning. That's, that's that, but um, at least it fixes those tools. Right? So it pr would probably be a good idea to, to have that and then explicitly disable the compiler warning that warns about that. Question? Yes? I wouldn't do that. No, no, uh, Jason. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was wondering how generic those static analysis targets are. Like, if I wanted to add some CTEST, or in some of my code bases, I have, a, I guess, a regex that reports on lines that have new bases on them, for example. Is, is that something that I can then look at? Uh, uh, the um, no. no. So are they extensible or are they, are those just I mean, they are extensible. In, and the question is, how extensible are those uh, target properties? Um, at least you can set them on on individual targets, okay. right? And and for, you can organize your code in such a way that um, you want to have different warnings for different targets. But there's no like CDP check, uh, for example. But you can add your own. No, no, just those, um, OK, the question is, can you add your own, um, for example, your own check, uh, your, your own properties for, for your own static analysis tools? No, the answer is no. Those are hard coded in CMake. Chandler? Okay. The command from Chandler is you should use um, you should you, when you use uh, W arrow from the beginning, then you basically always have um, have zero warnings. I disagree with that because I do not always start from scratch. Um, most of the time, I'm I'm introduced into an existing code base that has lots of warnings. And also, I have, I have those cases where I want to upgrade the, upgrade the compiler, which introduces new warnings. This is something I simply cannot ignore. I, I, I have these cases as well. And, and, and we, we, we disable the warnings until all of the errors in the code are fixed. And then we re-enable them. OK. The, 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 treat warnings differently from lint checks. They're not suggested. They're very, very serious. OK. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think this this is a discussion. I, I do not agree. I think we can have the discussion afterwards. Peter. I have a question. If this is a fixed set, so you cannot have your own static analysis tool easily built into that. So mm -hmm. like you have to backslint because you have a license and want to run that from CMake easily, it wouldn't work. Um if you if for example if you want to introduce FlexLint, um it will not work. That's correct. So I mean, 
you can maybe abuse those if they uh, if they accept the same compile flex or so. But really, those are hard coded in CMake. Um, okay. So, like like I said, this this guideline here from John Lakers, I think, makes sense. I had once had a code base where I really had this problem: um, how to add those source files. Um, simple bash script that I came up with. I can no longer explain how it does it, but it really solved the problem. <laughs> okay, and this is an example how how to do how to control, control this from the outside. Um, I can take any CMake project, and I uh, configure it like this. I set the um, C compiler to Clang, the C++ compiler to Clazy, and I, I can, from outside, set um, Clang tidy, um, and also uh, include what you use. And it's absolutely not necessary to put any of that into the uh, project definition itself. Um, I can just um, control it from outside for any CMake project. And um, this is supported out of the box by all the IDEs because it will appear directly in the build output. And if the IDE um, supports uh, fixed hints from, from Clan, then it will simply think that the fixed hints that it receives from Clang Tidy um, have the same origin, basically. Right. Yeah. So that was um, basically my talk. <laughs> Okay, I have some slides afterwards. Uh, if you're interested, um, I will cover also package config. Yeah, if you're interested, I can show them. Yeah, right. I mean, maybe we have um, additional questions first. Yeah. Uh, on one of your first slides, you mentioned that it's uh, preferable to use uh, target compile features over explicitly using um, compiler flags. Now, what happens if I have two components? One uses a C++ 11 feature, the other doesn't. Will I not get possible linker errors? Because CMake chose different compiler flags. Very good question. So the, the, the question is, if I have two different libraries, one um, requires compile flags that, I mean, has compile flags that require, C, um, have compile f features that require C++11, and another one requires a C++14, then CMake will figure it out. That, that's the whole point of that. I mean, if I, if I set the compile flags explicitly, they will probably collide. But if I just tell CMake what my requirements are, and CMake will figure out the compile flags, it will make sure that it does not clash. Will this also work when, when they are private? Yes, okay. it also works when they are private. Yeah. Have you used Conan? I have not used Conan. But you are aware of it. I'm aware of it, but I haven't really uh, evaluated it. Given some caveats. Does it, does it, does it, does it solve, does it solve those requirements that I have? Most of them. Mm, we can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No more questions? Then I can give you some additional information. Okay. So. Uh, this is my, my personal wish list of, um, I think, what the future of CMake uh, might look like. And I'm, uh, for all of the following ideas, I have already started a prototype. Um, if you want to contribute, you're welcome. You can talk to me. So, one thing, so disclaimer, there's absolutely no guarantee that any of that will be added to CMake at all, okay? But what I would like to have is pre-compiled headers as a usage requirement. So imagine this, right? I have a command called target pre-compiled headers. I give it a list of headers. I mean, public headers, private headers, uh, interface headers. So CMake has all this information, what, what headers it needs to pre-compile for each target. And how, how this should we work internally uh, CMake may be able to calculate a list of headers per configuration and per language. 
uh, for the build specification of each target. And then it will generate a file that basically includes all those headers. And this generated header file is then used, I mean, to, I mean this is then used in the build system. Uh, I mean, CMake then tells the build system to pre-compile this header and also to force include this header in all uh, compilation units. Um, and since it's force included, it's absolutely not required that I have something like includes that AFX. Um, it will work if my build system supports pre-compiled headers, it will be maybe a little bit slow. Uh, it will be maybe a little bit faster. If it doesn't support them, it may be a little bit slower, but it does not affect the, uh, the project in any other way. So you do not have to change the source code. Um, the reason why I think that would be nice is imagine, let's say you use, uh, you create um, an interface library called Boost ASIO. You say, okay, boost slash ASIO should be uh, the public, public or interface pre-compiled header. So any project that uses boost ASIO will simply out of the box uh, pre-compile that header without adding any configuration. Any, everybody agrees that this would be nice? <laughs> okay. No. So, um, so, um, off. Um, so here. Um, this one, more languages. Um, CMake's core is actually language agnostic. Um, when you, when you um, request CMake for uh, C++ support, I mean, which is the default, but you, can, but you can turn it off. When you enable a language, then CMake will look into the module path and parse the necessary um, definitions. It finds there how to treat this warning. Um, so, CMake can be used with D by simply putting the necessary files in CMake module path. And, um, but there's a limitation. Um, this only works really for the C and C++ model where you have a source file which is translated to an object file and then those object files are linked together. If you imagine if we tweak that in a, uh, in a, in a way that we say, okay, a source file the output of a source file may be another source file, which is then compiled to an object file and then linked. Um, just having that would allow, for example, treating protobuf as a library, as a, as a language, Qt resources or any other IDL, but it will also allow using CMake for all those list of libraries, that, uh, list of languages that are listed here. I got it from Wikipedia. Um, those are all the languages that support compiling to C or C++. Question. Isn't there some Asian Java support? Sir? Isn't there some Asian Java support? There's already, I mean, there's already Java support in CMake, but not cross compiling to, uh, I mean, using this way, we could cross compile Java to C and then um, actually build C. Not ever Java. Uh, I, I just took the list of, <laughs> of uh, from Wikipedia with all the languages that support cross compiling. I don't even know all those languages, so I have no, can give no guarantee that this would actually work. Jeff? Um, can I ask another question? Um, Sir? Other than, uh, other than having boost softening in it, um, are there things in the chain about the boost support in CMake? So I would, the question is whether I would change the boost support in CMake. I would like to drop it. I would like to drop the boost support in CMake, but, act, but instead add CMake support to boost. That's, yeah. But can you be more specific about what should change? What should change? I mean, if boost would use CMake, that would make it easy because then we can simply use CMake to export all this in definition. If boost does not use CMake, then we should at least teach boost build how to generate CMake project files and uh, CMake package files. So uh, to answer your question about uh, package config, find package currently has two different modes. It has a package mode and a config mode. So it first tries to use uh, the, it first tries to find um, a CMake package. If it fails, it will load the CMake find, uh, the, the find module for that. I would like to add an additional mode uh, that parses the package config files and simply generates imported targets. We can, but I mean, look. I looked at the uh, implementation of, of package conf, and it looks complicated for three different reasons. I mean, there are basically three different things that it does. 
uh, it has containers because it's written in C, so it requires a C, uh, it requires a string, um, it, it requires um, um, function for string manipulation, hash set, etc. But when you do it in C++, we, can, we don't need this. And the other thing is uh, transitively calculating all the dependencies. But CMake already does that. So the only thing that is actually necessary is pass those files. Right? So if you just pass those files uh, and define generated targets from that, um, CMake, I mean, the, the usual propagation will, will just work. Uh, uh, and the, the last thing that I would like to be interested in uh, is, uh, I mean, currently the, the CMake language processor has its own implementation. And there was an approach, uh, it can be found in the, in the wiki, um, to replace that with Lua. But um, the, the way it was implemented, it was just when, I mean, it wanted to add a Lua front end, and whenever you call a function in Lua, it would translate that to a CMake command and then execute it on the, on the CMake processor, that command. I would do it the other way around. I would like to replace the CMake language processor by the Lua virtual machine and uh, build the, the current language as a front end to Lua. Right. And this would allow then, I mean, we would still have the current uh, modules, they would still work, but it was also possible to write CMake modules in Lua. And the last thing is um, for the front end, so for the, instead of the CMake list TXT file, I would like to have a de declarative language uh, which allows procedural subroutines. So libucl uh, would be an option. Uh, it is that was previously shown that it's possible uh, to extend with Lua. This is uh, what I wish to have. And, and then, of course, you can tell me whether you have additional ideas. Thanks. <laughs>